Uh, my name is Adele Youssef. I'm an ex-Googler, a Google lover. And I had been honored to be one of the teams that did Google My Location Technology, or the famous Blue Dot, which is also a winner of Google Founders Award for Innovation. Uh, I'm also Egyptian, who has passion about Egypt, and my love to Egypt was bit more, more than my love to Google. So I decided to move back to Egypt after the revolution and help with building Egypt 2.0. I'm also happy to be a loyal attendee for Where 2 in the last seven years. So I am really thankful for inviting me today to share with you how LPS or how location-based services used to build Egypt 2.0. Currently, I am as a founder and CEO of Wireless Stars, a company working on mobile cloud computing with one mission, which is enabling location-based services in the Middle East and North Africa region. So, Today I'm going to speak about certain cases, certain use cases for location-based services that I found interesting that was used during the revolution and after the revolution. Uh, to start with, I'll just start describing one popular application called Entafein. Entafein is the Arabic word for where are you? So Entafein, it's a mobile location-aware social network. Think of it as Foursquare with a focus to the Arab world. One thing that I want to highlight when I say this is that when I say the Arab word, we think it's just about speaking Arabic, which is not true. We have actually 22 different countries in the Arab world, and the 22 different countries has different cultures. So when you think of translation, it is not language translation, it's culture, tra culture translation. So culture, culture translation means localizing badge, for example, as you'll see here, for each country, localizing a mayor, what this mayor will look like and for each country different culture, different mentalities, and it need to be localized. And being location-based services has to be local to this culture. So it's not just translating language. Of course, also, you reward the users through Interfain offers, which is discounts and coupons similar to the regular here. We also have some interesting infographics that I will, I'm not going to discuss it because this is not the code, but you'll find it in the website of the company, which tell, tells you how Interfain was evolving in the last nine months since it was launched in the Middle East and North Africa region. Also, Interfain was honored to be one of the 20 finalists for Start With Google competition, which is a Google competition that was done after the revolution uh, for promoting entrepreneurship in the region. Okay, enough about Interfain. Let's see how Interfain was used in the Middle East during the revolution and after the revolution. To start with, I'll start with Libya case. So it started by the Libyans want to get rid of a tyrant. And to do this, they have a revolution. Of course, their fellow Egyptians who are next door wanted to help. Many volunteers jumped into volunteering time, volunteering effort, money, medical, and there was a lot of humanitarian convoys that wants to move from different major cities in Egypt, like Cairo, Alexandria, going to Tripoli to transfer food and medical supplies there two major problems with facing those convoys. Number one, the command central wanted to know what is the location of these convoys in order to communicate this to the revolutionists in Libya so that they can wait for them at the border to escort them to Tripoli. Of course, we can think of this, okay, why don't you use fleet management? Yeah, fleet management, GPS enabled systems, all this luxurious, not to mention during a revolution. So, this was a problem, and those volunteers needed to manage this fleet in ad hoc way. Another problem is that most of those volunteers who are riding the convoys are going to a war zone. So their families and friends are worried about them. They wanted to keep track of them. They wanted to know, are they safe? What is happening? Are they returning? And location-aware mobile social network was used to solve this problem. First, the driver used Interfain to check in at different stops. And when they check in, they start shouting about what's happening. They have an accident, they have a problem, they have a sandstorm. And this is how the command center keep track of them and then communicate this to the revolutionists in Libya. The other part was the volunteers themselves, they were checking in. And while they're checking in, both this to Facebook and Twitter. So their family and friends keep track of what they are doing along the road. And they know that they arrive safely and they are coming back and where they are. This was shown, actually, I'll try to show this through some Twitter. So this is, I checked in, this is the driver. I checked in at Alamin Road, 
joined by a truck of Mustafa Mahmoud. This is a check-in. Alamin Road is a highway between Alexandria and Tripoli. Another interesting check-in is, I just take at the border, this is when he crossed the border, he checked in, and this is how the command center start communicating this to the revolutionists to escort them. Another side effect of this that I noticed happening is the social media marketing, but for promoting activism. So when people start saying this, they start being not afraid to come down to the street and volunteer in this effort. And we start having more convoys going to Libya, more people volunteering time and money and promoting activists. This was an interesting way, a case where you can see how fleet management was done in ad hoc way and also social media to promote activism. Another case, use case, which was very interesting is during the revolution itself. So during the revolution itself, people start going down. It started from the Facebook. They start creating events and calling each other to go down the streets and do protests. One thing about the Facebook event is that you will say, I'm attending, you like, but this doesn't mean that you are going down to the street. One nice thing about the check-in application is you are showing to your fellow and your, your fellow Egyptians and your friends that you are actively in the location and you are actually protesting. And the tweet I'm sharing at the top is common thing. So I just checked at Muzahra Millionaire, love, long live Egypt. Muzahra Millionaire is a one million protest. And basically what he was doing is he's checking in in the protest itself. And he was calling his friends to come down to the street and saying, I am there and you need to come and support me. This actually didn't go this way, it actually promotes activism. People start going to the street and participating in this. And of course, we didn't forget to reward them by doing a special badge for the protest. So this is actually tells you how localized culture is important. So this was just the, event, the starting point during the revolution. After the revolution, we start being, seeing many of these events. The top left photo, which is national delegates, Actually, this is something actually happened after the revolution. After the revolution, the police force just disappeared. There is no police and there is no traffic control. But this drive more of crowdsourced traffic control, crowdsourced police, crowdsourced services. And this is actually has been happening in the last year a lot, crowdsourcing revolution. But it is not a revolution to throw a tyrant, it's a revolution to build a developed country. So the national delegates was one example. People going to clean the street, people planting trees, repainting the street, and they are feeling ownership of their country. Many of this happens, and this was the purse of interfane events. So basically, instead of checking at a location, you create an event, and you start checking in these events to promote people to come and participate in these events. And this happens a lot. Then we start seeing a need for a different social network. Why? Because Facebook actually help us to connect with friends and family. But I don't want to connect on friends and family. I want to connect with people who are sharing the same neighborhood with me. I want to connect with people who are sharing the same interest. I want today to paint the street or plant the trees, or I want to work on education, or I want to help the needy, or I want to, I'm a doctor and I want to help sick people. So there is interest and there is location. Facebook fails to do this. If I want to participate in some effort, if I want to volunteer, using Facebook, I cannot find anything in my neighborhood or anything that shares my interest. And this was the purse of one yad. Yad is the Arabic word for hand. And one yad means one hand. And this was the slogan of the revolution. We are all one yad, united in one hand in order to build our country. And one yad is a new social network that is driving people from social networking to social working. Another nice example was Zabattak. Zabattak is the Arabic word for I quote you. And Zabattak is another crowdsourced anti-crime, anti-corruption effort. As I said, you will see a lot of crowdsourced networks built after the revolution because we need to build the country and you want to do this bottom up. You want to do it by the people. You want to empower the people. So, Zabattak, basically, people start reporting corruption, reporting crime, and report this with a location signal and real time and with the type of the accident. 
and they use Ushahidi to plot this information. So you have a way to see where is corruption, where is crime, and then you need to start crowdsourcing fighting this. Another interesting network was crowdsourced traffic. Two applications here be Oleg, or they tell you, and Wassani gave me a ride, both also emerged after the revolution. Both of them are trying to solve the traffic problem in a crowdsourced way. You go and report if there is a traffic congestion, and you report the color, red, yellow, blue. And you start doing this across all cities, and then they aggregate this information and serve it to do traffic control, and many more. I think what I have been seeing in the last months is, is lots of effort to help the major problems resulting from the 30 years of corruption in Egypt. And all this is crowdsourced. Whether this in health, or whether this to do waste management awareness, or whether to do new ways of recycling, it is happening. And lots of innovation are coming, as I see. In conclusion, Egypt was known to be the country of the pyramids. But actually, this is not the case anymore. I have seen in the last year, after the youth start feeling ownership of the country, lots of efforts, lots of innovation. And this innovation is mobile, social, and location aware. I think we are now at the bottom of the pyramid, but we have a strong use and strong hands to climb the pyramid soon and be at the top of the pyramid soon. I believe the Egyptian youth and the Arab youth can do this. Thank you very much for your listening, and I'll be happy to answer your questions.